Okay, so um, thanks for sharing the email ID. What I'll do today is I'll share the video with uh, the whoever you know is operating the the batch email ID. I think that's easier. Then you can straight away sort of upload it on Google Classroom, right? Okay, so let's pick it up from where we had left off. Uh, we are going to begin the text of the unnameable today and see if we can sort of you know. What I'm trying to do is to divide the text just in terms of length into these chunks of around 30 pages. And we'll try and cover that in order to be able to finish the, the, the text in time, uh, because we have three classes, including this one. Uh, so just to you know, perhaps jog your memory a little bit, we were talking about this, uh, this process of not believing in one's own subjectivity. Un, uh, you know, questioning the subject. I say I unbelieving. That's where we had started. And this idea of the setting of the novel being some sort of an infernal space, some sort of a post mortal space from where a voice speaks. Uh, one of the problems uh, behind this divided subject that we see in the unnameable is the problem of identification, the problem of not being I, not being able to identify with your own voice. I mean, think about this situation. If I'm alone in a room and if I can hear my voice, which is the only voice I can hear, and if I still think that's not my voice, I will have to assume that there's someone else with me. But having said that, if I know there's no one else with me, what do I do with that conundrum? Am I alone? Am I with others? This is a conundrum that is present throughout this novel. Is the unnameable alone or is it with others, other, others around him? And it's interesting that, uh, you know, Beckett often uses his own characters as these others, you know? So there would be references to previous books, like he references Mercier, Camier. These are characters from an earlier novel, Mercier and Camier. Of course, he references Molloy, Malone, uh, and again, Murphy and Watt. So there's a certain strange kind of an authorial aspect to this voice. Uh, the space itself, as it were, as I said, it's an infernal space, but it could also be inside the skull. You know, there's a point where the, the narrator kind of speculates whether he's inside somebody's head. But the question remains whether he's inside his own head or someone else's head, you know, going back to the sort of one of these classical theories in psychology, where we talk about the homunculus, that there is a homunculus inside us, as it were, some other self inside us. Anyway, so, uh, so we, we do have these kinds of problems. Am I alone? Am I not alone? Who is this voice that is speaking as if it is me? Uh, so as I said, if I'm not able to identify with my own voice, it leads to this particular hesitation between solitude and company. And we don't know whether we are alone or not. And this is one of the sort of central problems uh, we have in a lot of Beckettian texts, not just this one. You would encounter this in texts for nothing, which is the short prose text, uh, the series of short prose texts he wrote after the unnameable. You would see this in his uh, great late work, How It Is, which is almost an epic uh, that goes back to this particular it's a very platonic question, going back to philosophy, the question of one and the many. This is the, a very important question in, in Plato's works. This, this sort of, uh, the, I mean, the entire question of philosophy, in fact, hinges around this idea of the one and the many, the solitude and multitude. Anyway, we, we might go back to Plato a little bit uh, on certain occasions, but let me proceed. Uh, the very first paragraph, and I'm reading from the text that has already been circulated. It's on page 31. So the very first paragraph uh, refers to aporia, this word that uh, many of you may have encountered in critical theory, especially in Derrida's work. Uh, it's again very interesting that the narrator says, I, aporia, I say aporia without knowing what it means. So not that he even knows the meaning of the word aporia which already points towards lack of meaning because aporia is a dead end. It's like a blind spot in meaning. And that's how Derrida would famously use this term in, in his works uh, that, that deal with, you know, 
to, to simplify things, let's call it the method of uh, deconstruction. Anyway, uh, so the word aporia comes in. Uh, as I see it, this entire book could be seen as an academic satire, as a satire on academic acts. You know, there are references to questions, hypotheses. The word dissertation will appear. There are references to various kinds of academic masters, pedagogues, and the whole question of pedagogy is one of the central themes of the book. Let's keep that in mind. But this is pedagogy as tyranny. Uh, there's a sort of politics at work. So in one sense, one could say that the unnameable, the book uh, or the novel, is about the politics of subjectivation. What is subjectivation? The very formation of the subject. The formation of a human subject, uh, the process of its formation itself is political. Why? Be because it involves others. I mean, very simply, there is no self without another, right? And of course, I mean, this is the famous Hegelian thread uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis develops. Uh, Lacan was a sort of, in a way, a student of Hegel's in the sense that he would, was someone who would go to the seminars of Alexandre Koyer, uh, Koyev. Sorry, not Koyer, that's another guy. Uh, Alexander Koyev, and he was uh, he was a frequenter in those seminars, and these were the very influential seminars in France where Hegel's teaching was discussed in France, and it had a sort of uh, very uh, strong impact on on the entire sort of French uh, reception of Hegel. Uh, anyway, uh, Hegel is an important reference point here because, as you shall see if you read the book, uh, there is you know this very clearly Hegelian kind of a dialectic at work between the subject and the other. One thing that is often forgotten when we think about the master-slave dialectic in Hegel, and of course, uh, it would be good to read Phenomenology of Spirit as well as Philosophy of Right, where he discusses this. But one thing that is often forgotten is the fact that the master and the slave could well be both inside us. He's also making a psychological claim not just a philosophical claim, but also a psychological claim. Why psychological? Because uh, in Hegel, the idea is there are these two self-consciousnesses, right? They could both be part of the same subject. So we are not necessarily talking about an external master or an external slave. Uh, here, he is basically taking us through a particular stage in the development of human consciousness. And in this stage, what he calls the master-slave dialectic happens because the two self-consciousnesses come into some sort of a conflictual relationship and they have to establish each other and themselves as against each other. So that leads to a kind of fight unto death or a fight of honor, as, as Hegel says. And this is the establishment of the master and slave. So the, the point that I want to underline is that the master and the slave are or could be parts of the same consciousness, you know, the self-consciousness that splits itself into two, right? One becomes the master, the other becomes the slave. This is something that, again, if we think, uh, you know, through some of our own decision-making processes in life, in everyday life, this is something that we'll all be able to identify with. There are often two voices in us. One says, do it. The other says, don't. One voice is strong. The other voice is weak. But it's reversible. And that's also very Hegelian. The master and the slave, their relation is reciprocal. It's a reversible relation. The master could become the slave. The slave could become the master. It's not, it's not a one-sided uh, relationship. Okay, let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, now, the master and the slave become important because at one level, and those of you who have read Waiting for God would uh, understand what I'm talking about, uh, but even otherwise, uh, at some level, one could argue the unnameable gives Lucky, the slave, right, in Waiting for Godot, the, the honor of narration. This is a slave's narrative. This is a slave's narrative. Of course, contrapuntally, the master appears, and quite strongly. And again, the setup, as I said, is very Hegelian, also because in Hegel's philosophy, uh, the prime master, the supreme master, is death. You know? So if there's a master of the master, that's death. And we have this sort of, you know, death-ridden psyche in the unnameable. Uh, as we would see, many of these failed stories 
also culminate in certain kinds of death. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. But uh, let's remember this third party in the master-slave dialectic, i.e. death. Death as the supreme master or the master of the master. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, again, the second paragraph on page 31, we already have this idea of the puppet, you know, as if, uh, you know, the unnameable is in charge. So there are these moments when he thinks he is a master and he's in charge of these puppets, such as, you know, uh, Malone and, and uh, even Molloy or Moran sometimes. And there's this uh, almost a galactic kind of imagination that these others are wheeling around him. And Beckett often draws this in the notebooks, if we go back to the manuscripts, that at the center, uh, there is there's, there's this static body, uh, the unnameable. And then around the unnameable, we have these wheeling figures who appear orbiting around him, as it were. Sometimes it's uh, Malone, sometimes it's Moran, sometimes it's the figures from pre previous books, which, as I said, gives the unnameable, gives the book, some sort of an authorial space, as it were. This inferno is perhaps the creative, you know, skullscape of the writer, the head of the writer, where all these characters are, you know, coming into being. But many of them are still born. Many of them are unborn. Many of them are dead. So, you know, again, all these ramifications come in. Uh, the dead and the unborn are not exactly the same, of course. Uh, you know, as he says, he's going to talk about people with things, people without things, things without people. What does it matter? I flatter myself. This is page 32. I flatter myself. It will not take me long to scatter them, scatter the puppets to the wind, right? To the winds. This is something that is said throughout. So again, uh, we have the, the next paragraph beginning with Malone is there of his mortal liveliness, little trace remains. So this is again some sort of a post-mortal residue of Malone. Malone has already died, as we know, inside one of the stories, uh, as I was saying last time. Uh, there's an attempt to know the place, the place around, the place that uh, you know, uh, the unnameable finds himself in. Uh, he wants to measure the place. He doesn't know whether it's a circular place or it's a, you know, it's an infinite place. Is it a finite uh, locus? He wants to know the place, wants to measure it, but can't because he's stagnant. Uh, he has a, has, has a, has a very, let, let's say, a fragmented body. I might come back to this later, but he has a fragmented body. Uh, he is severely decapacitated, uh, you know. So he, he's not in a position to move and, in a way, chart the place, but he wants to. Okay? That's one thing to keep in mind, that he wants to measure and know the place around him. Uh, all these questions, he keeps asking questions, and he keeps saying, well, that's the last question, no more questions. Uh, so again, if you see the sort of parody here on page 32, let me read these two sentences and you'll understand what I'm talking about. No more questions, full stop. And the next sentence is, is not this rather the place where one finishes vanishing? Again, will the day come when Malone will pass before me no more? Will the day come when, Mal will, will the day come when Malone will pass before the spot where I was? So all these are questions. So after the sentence, no more questions, there are as many as six, seven questions. This tone or this uh, device of contradiction is used throughout the book. Contradiction is one of the most uh, recurrent, uh, you know, logical devices used throughout this book. And that's, again, part of the larger question of eclipsing narrative realism. As I was saying, if you think about contradiction as a trope, contradiction goes against the realistic idea of a correspondence between what you're saying and what exists in the real world outside what you're saying. Let's say if I say uh, there's a bird on the branch just outside my window. And if you see a bird there, that's a realistic correspondence. But if I say there is a bird and there is no bird there, that's a contradiction. And that contradiction is difficult to you know, justify at the level of realism. It's like the Schrodinger's cat paradox. Or, uh, it's, it's the 
famous paradox, which uh, I mean, most of you would know already. Anyway, let me not go into that. But the important point I wanted to flag here is how contradiction eclipses realism, eclipses realism of the narrative. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, this hypothesis that he develops here, this entire section, the first 10 pages or so, is called a preamble. This term appears around uh, the end of this section where you would see there's a space and then the second part begins, though it's not overtly called a second part. Now, uh, the unnameable says that uh, he's bathed in tears, but he doesn't feel pain. There's no sadness in his heart. So what is what what is all this, you know, what, what are all these tears all about? There's a very striking expression which is used here, uh, liquefied brains on page 33. Perhaps it's liquefied brain. So again, there's this idea of inability, the brain not able to function properly. As I was saying, I mean, one way of reading this text is to see it in the context of the war as a concentration camp allegory of this dead voice in a death camp. But another way of looking at it is to read it through that sort of Cartesian theater of thinking as a theater of horror, as a theater of cruelty, where thinking is a kind of torture. Uh, allied with that, one could think of this idea of not being able to think because of a brain, brain problem, let's say a cerebral function, not being, you know, uh, not allowing the subject to think clearly. This is something that happens with people who suffer, you know, brain lesions or uh, brain lesions, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, they, they often uh, develop a certain capacity for thinking, but when it comes to particular kinds of thoughts, they're not able to feel, especially they're not able to feel pain or, you know, sometimes their intellectual function is unharmed in spite of the brain lesion, but what gets harmed is their ability to feel uh, affects. Uh, Catherine Malibu has worked quite a bit on this, which might be interesting. He calls them cool psyches, cool in the sense that they're indifferent, they're cold. Uh, they're psyches that are able to process thought, but not able to process emotions. Uh, anyway, to come back to the unnameable, uh, the, the tears that he's bathed in are, as it were, liquefied brains. And that again implies some sort of a cerebral impairment, which causes this, you know, poor thinking or weak thought, let's say. Uh, there's also this reference here to, and it's there throughout the book, uh, this memory gone clean. He has no memory. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the question of innate knowledge also comes into the picture in this part of the book. Uh, he has no memories, which again brings us back to Plato in one sense, this whole idea of memory as unforgetting, anamnesis, anamnesis and hypomnesis. These are the two terms Plato uses to talk about uh, forgetting and unforgetting. So all memories are acts of unforgetting. You have to undo an act of forgetting in order to remember something. And in Plato's famous uh, theory of transmigrating souls, this is an idea that prevails, right? That when uh, it's not exactly like the Hindu religious idea of reincarnation, but nevertheless, it's, it comes close to that. Uh, the idea is that when the souls transmigrate from one realm to another, they will lose the memory of the previous realm. Uh, they will not have that memory. It's like a blank slate now, right? Uh, so this, this is one way of thinking about this, you know, memory all gone, which is something that recurs in the unnameable. But a more Cartesian way of looking at it is, of course, this whole idea of the mind as a tabula rasa. I'm sure you've heard this expression, tabula rasa, which is blank. And you're kind of writing things there. But one of these questions in Descartes is, and not just Descartes, in the entire sort of classical tradition there, Descartes, Spinoza, David Hume, uh, the question becomes very important whether there could be some sort of an innate knowledge. Is there an innate knowledge, right? And Descartes famously talks about these clear and distinct ideas. Uh, but whether there could be an innate knowledge is a question that goes further back to the likes of Plato, right? 
because again, if you if you think about dialogues like Mino and others, where Plato talks about again the slave, the figure of the slave is is verily present there. So there's that famous Platonic moment where the slave is able to uh, you know conduct complex mathematical exercises, and this completely befuddles the masters. He's illiterate. How is this illiterate slave able to do all this mathematical stuff? And again, the question goes back to this idea of innate knowledge. And this, of course, leads Plato in a very different uh, direction that I wouldn't want to go to. But nevertheless, uh, the, the point that I wanted to highlight is there's this question of innate knowledge, which is evoked in the unnameable. Um, to go back to what we were talking about, just give me a second as I uh, to go back to what we were talking about, as I said, uh, the whole dynamic of the book revolves around this idea that the unnameable has to say something about himself. There has to be some kind of self-expression. But the self-expression is denied because his masters, and these masters would very soon be given names, Basil and Mahud, these are the two names that would be given, uh, these masters put him inside their own stories, making him feel that he that these are his stories, but they're not. And that's the problem. Uh, on this page, uh, that's the situation. We, we go back to that point. But on this page, on page 33, we also have this, this idea of rhetoric. You know, the discourse must go on. So one invents obscurities, rhetoric. The discourse has to go on in the sense that he has to say something about himself, but he's constantly diverted from that self-expression by the tyrannical masters. Uh, on this page, he also talks about the, the problem of the lights. There are these unstable, twinkling, but you know, uh, you know uh, intermittent and inconsistent lights uh, that blind him sometimes that go off all of a sudden and it's completely dark. So the problem of the lights, and again, lights, as you know, were often used in death camps as a sort of torture mechanism, where uh, a light would be flashed on your face and again, it will be extinguished the next moment, flashed again, extinguished again, and that was often used as a torture mechanism. So, and, and Beckett himself uses this another kind of as another kind of torture mechanism in a play called Play. It's a play called Play. Uh, where we have the urns and the shifting light that tortures the faces that are, you know, popping out of the urns. Anyway, uh, so the problem of the lights, uh, he also wonders whether he has a ear, whether he's able to, you know, hear anything. So all these sensations, the visual sensation, the auditory sensation, we will see that the auditory sensation becomes very important towards the latter half of the book. Perhaps we'll talk about it tomorrow or day after. But uh, both these senses are important, the visual and the auditory. But these organs uh, do not function in tandem with the body. You know, what we see in the unnameable is a body, you know, to use that expression that again Artho uses and Deluge and others have picked up on that big time, uh, body without organs body without organs. It was originally used by Antonio Narto. Uh, anyway, a body without organs, I'm not sure whether we can call this a body without organs, but there's definitely, uh, the organs often seem to uh, act or you know function in an autonomous way. And the body is nothing but like a heap. Uh, it doesn't function at all. So we have this weird kind of autonomous functioning of the organs. Because sometimes the unnameable feels it is just an eye. Uh, anyway, it feels it's like a ball. So it has a circular shape. It's not a typical human being. Uh, it also feels sometimes it's just an eye. An equine eye is the expression that is used. Uh, sometimes it feels like a tympanum, uh, the inner part of the ear. So the unnameable often feels reduced to his organs. But there is no him. It's just the organs functioning by themselves, right? That's why I said I'm not sure whether to call it body without organs, but more like autonomously functioning organs and a body which is not quite amounting to anything, right? Uh, the body is stagnant, as I said, it can't move. There is disability there uh, when it comes to movement. Uh, the other thing that we notice in this first part is 
this uh, this sort of fear of change when it comes to the unnameable. He's afraid of anything changing in this world around him. The color that is mentioned, again, to go back to the visual cue, is gray. This is like a gray void. This inferno, the space he finds himself in, is like a gray void. And he's, he's trying to imagine how he came into this place. There's no memory. He's trying to imagine when he came into this place. Was he here forever? Again, there's no memory. It refers to Inferno at one point and it says, well, hell could be considered eternal. But then after all, you know, it dates from the birth of Lucifer. So I'm trying to date this place. I'm trying to imagine the beginning of this place. When did this place come into being? But again, there's no, there's no answer to that question either. How does time function in this place is another question. But, you know, as he say, says at the end of page 34, he's not stone deaf because there are sounds that reach him. Um, let me just proceed a little bit further. Um, you know, this idea of company, uh, what was the first sound that he heard? Uh, was it the sound of the other? And, you know, of course, all of this is accompanied with a very typical, you know, Beckettian humor, such as this sentence on page 35, a man may die at the age of 70, without ever having had the possibility of seeing Halley's Comet, right? So you die at 70, you've had a full life, but you've never seen a Halley's Comet. It's a typical kind of Beckettian dig at the insignificance of human life. You know, as, as he famously said in one of the later stories, I don't know about man's destiny, I could tell you more about radishes. Anyway, uh, so that kind of dry Irish humor is something that is there throughout the book. Uh, to go back to that color gray and just make one quick point before I uh, talk about something else, uh, the color gray is particularly important and it has a historical significance. Of course, you understand the conceptual point. Gray is neither black nor white, right? So it's an intermediary. It's like an intermediate, uh, intermediate color. It's a color that has both white and black and is neither. So that's one conceptual point where it's kind of mixed up and the unnameable is mixed up between himself and these others. Sometimes he doesn't know whether he is Basil, whether he is Mahund, whether he is the other. So he's often feeling completely alienated by the other. Sometimes he wants to identify with the other. It's really complicated, this sort of politics of subjectivation, as I say, this politics of subject formation. But the color gray has another historical significance in the sense that it is often associated with the color uh, the haze takes after the explosion of an atom bomb. And this color had a role to play in Endgame, which is again, you know, as uh, Adorno famously said, it's a play about the atom bomb because it does not talk about the atom bomb. Just like, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's Purloined Letter is a story about the letter because it doesn't tell us what the letter is all about. So there's a hole or a kind of a lack in the content, but that lack in the content becomes a principle of formalization. Uh, the lack in the content itself becomes a form. Anyway, uh, without getting into that, uh, the color gray is important, but this color will soon be contradicted again. And the unnameable would say, no, this is a black void. I should, I should have never mentioned gray. There's nothing gray about this. This is black. So there are these contradictions and self-denials that keep happening. Uh, let me just move forward a little bit. Uh, what do these uh, others talk to him about? You know, the question of innate mentioned on page 36, can it be innate knowledge? And then, you know, uh, it is said that these tyrannical others keep talking about you know, things like motherhood, who's the mother? Uh, they also gave me a lowdown, the lowdown on God. They told me I depended on, depended on him in the last analysis. They had it on the reliable authority of his agents at Bali. I forget what, this being the place, according to them, where the inestimable gift of life had been rammed down my gullet. So one thing, let's make this clear, the unnameable, the novel, is quite an anarchist novel. It's an anarchist novel because it 
thinks or it wants to provoke us into this thinking that all ideologies, all giant ideologies are dictatorial and all ideologies aim at, you know, dictating terms with the self. So we have to abandon ideologies. Uh, as I say, this is also a critique of the humanist model of education. All these masters are trying to make the unnameable into a human being. But he's resisting that process of disciplining. To use that sort of Foucaultian word, uh, the studia humanitatis or the humanist education model, the, the man-making religion model, is also at one level, of course, it's deeply anthropocentric, but it's also at one level, uh, you know, a, a kind of a dictatorial ideology if we go by the logic of this novel. And that's where this idea of thought as torture comes in, because you're made to become reasonable. And this whole rationalist education model is a kind of disciplining the subject resists, the unnameable resists. Uh, if you ask, how does he resist? The answer to that would be uh, through his stupidity. Stupidity or incomprehension, this is the other word that is used uh, throughout the book. Incomprehension is what makes him uh, the unnameable. He cannot be named, he cannot be marked by these tyrants of humanist education who try to make a human being out of him. He would not want that. He would not uh, want to be disciplined or civilized into a human being. And that's the resistance through incomprehension. If I'm the stupidest student on earth who doesn't understand anything, whatever you teach me, I won't understand. But as a result, you will not be able to mold me. Right. And that's the point. Right? Uh, again, on page 37, we see they also taught me to count and even to reason. Some of this rubbish has come in handy on occasions. I don't deny it on occasions which would never have arisen if they had left me in peace. So you see, the, the, as I said, you know, the, the problem of, you know, this, this knowledge being imposed on the unnameable. Uh, let me just move on a little bit further. Uh, as I said, the, you know, he's deeply suspicious whether ideas of day and night actually uh, apply to this place. This may not be the earth. It may not be the sky, it might be some other planet, some other universe, uh, some parallel universe. We don't know where this novel is located, as, as, I, as I've been saying. Uh, you know, the color gray again comes back on page 39. Um, so around page 40, that's the end of this preamble. As page 41 straight away declares, I hope this preamble will soon come to an end and the statement begin that will dispose of me. So he wants to be disposed of, but that can only be when he's able to tell his own story. But as I said, he was, he's not allowed to tell his story by these others. Um, this, the word statement again brings us back to some sort of an academic dissertation, as it were, you know, a statement that you write, a problem statement, an argument statement. There's constantly this critique of uh, academia, which is kind of, again, takes us back to waiting for Godot, right? That, that famous expression, academia or academia, whatever you want to call it. So Beckett was uh, all his life, I mean, he was uh, uh, initially for, for a very brief period, a teacher. He hated teaching and, uh, you know, did the wise thing that we don't do. He left teaching and, uh, you know, uh, entirely sort of became a professional creative writer. Anyway, let's not get into that part of the, the woods. Um, okay. Now, this problem of knowledge, not being able to know anything, and as I said, this idea of the skullscape being inside somebody's head, this is mentioned on page 41. Uh, he doesn't know where, where he is, so that's the failure of knowledge. He doesn't know what place is this. Uh, I'll never know, which is perhaps merely the inside of my distant skull, where once I wandered, now I'm fixed, lost for tininess. Uh, tininess, sorry, or straining against the walls with my head, my hands, my feet, my back, and ever murmuring my old stories, my, my old story, as if it were the first time. Uh, 
as I said, the problem is that the stories always come from the other in the unnameable. The subject himself, in this case, not is not able to tell a story. And that, that is why he feels alienated from all these stories. You know, uh, someone like James Koizzi famously said that uh, a bio, an autobiography is like an autre biography. Autre in French means the other. So in an, in an autobiography, it's more likely that the other will speak. Uh, in Beckett, again, we have that kind of an autre biographical setup. Even if we look at the late text company, where again, a similar situation happens. There's a voice that narrates all these old memories to someone who is on his back in the dark. And this someone never quite knows whether these are his memories, his childhood memories, or the childhood memories of someone else. He's not even able to understand whether the voice is speaking to him or whether he's simply overhearing things. So again, I mean, this, this ambiguity remains, this ambiguity in self-identification. Basil is mentioned uh, first time on page 42, Basil and his gang, uh, the gang of tyrants. And slowly we come to this realization that all his stories are heaped onto him by others. So he cannot identify with them. He doesn't know whether these are his stories at all. He wants to know what is his physical position. He knows he's seated, my hands on my knees, because of the pressure against my rump, against the soles of my feet, against the palms of my hands, against my knees. Against my palms, the pressure is of my knees, against my knees of my palms. But what is it that presses against my rump, against the soles of my feet? I don't know. And this I don't know keeps coming back. My spine is not supported. And anyway, so as I was saying, this, this uh, you know, Beckett's interest in Descartes, of course, was a subversive interest. Beckett didn't quite, you know, identify with this idea of the Archimedean point of certainty. And that's why he was also drawn to one of these post-Cartesian philosophers, a Flemish philosopher, Arnold Hewling. Arnold Hewling uh, is a, a post-Cartesian philosopher. Beckett kind of draw, drew our attention to him. He was very... Uh, obscure uh, in that sense in the history of philosophy. People, of course, talk more about Nicholas Mailbranch. Uh, Hewling, Mailbranch, they're all part of this occasionalist school, uh, which believes in God, which believes in uh, you know this idea that human being is a passive agent and God is the only sort of you know active force in the world. Uh, anyway, Beckett wasn't that drawn to the religious faith uh, in that whole philosophical narrative. But he was drawn especially by this ethics of Hewlings. Hewlings wrote a book called Ethics. And uh, there we have this mantra, which also becomes a Beckettian mantra in a way. Uh, Beckett uh, encountered Hewlings, by the way, again, when he was doing some reference work for Joyce. And this mantra goes in Hewlings, uh, where you're worth nothing, there you should want nothing. I'll come back to this in another class towards the end of the book where, you know, there's a section that would remind us of this, where you're worth nothing, there you should want nothing. Anyway, the, the reason I mentioned Hewlings here is that Hewlings uh, makes this argument about something that you don't know. I mean, unlike Descartes, you don't know. Uh, so unlike I think, therefore I am, which becomes a solid knowledge on which the entire self is based, here we have in Hewlings this idea of I don't know. You know? So let's keep that point in mind as we go on, but I'll come back to Arnold Hewlings. Uh, again, I mean, these sort of comical interludes, uh, I've often asked myself this question, then suddenly started talking about Malone's hat or Malloy's great coat or Murphy's suit. So again, we're talking about all these others. Uh, do they exist? But the question then remains, do I exist? Does the self exist either? Uh, what place is this? Is this big? Is this small? Is it an egg, like a circular place? Is it like a cylinder, a small cylinder? All these speculations we have in on, on page 43. Also, again, references to the galactic space, Sirius, Great Dog, all these installations sorry, constellations, I should say, uh, 
and again this idea that it's not gray it's black you know it comes back uh, another very obvious thing that you notice again is the lack of paragraphs unparagraphed pages as i was saying uh, is a stylistic feature from Molloy onwards long paragraphs and you know no paragraphs sometimes um all gone clean from my head page 45 that platonic idea as i was saying uh i want to quickly come to the first failed story uh but before that let me just see if there's anything else i wanted to mention going through these pages very quickly my speech parched voice again a very striking expression on page 47 speech parched voice i mean he's exhausted uh in talking as i said the one of the problematic things in this book is this inability to end talking and he's making fun of that at a very academic level as well this is the typical professorial symptom the professors can't stop talking they can't end a class they can't end a discussion uh, it's typical of professors right uh, as opposed to that beckett was a deeply silent man which is why perhaps he could not, never be a, a great teacher in the typical professorial sense uh, we have testimonies from his students that suggest that you know he was a very hesitant speaker, very shy, didn't want to talk. Uh, anyway, uh, but this idea of inability to stop talking, uh, sometimes Beckett scholars have called this a kind of logoria, like a speech diarrhea, essentially, a kind of logoria, where you can't stop talking. This logoria is very strongly present, and hence it's an exhausted voice, exhausted about, exhausted talking too much, but not able to finish talking either. Uh, there are these religious words that are used, like pensum, pensum, punishment, lesson, uh, the term confession will come later. And if you're wondering what is the, the religious scaffolding in that name, why is he using these, uh, these you know, uh, terminologies? Uh, as Beckett himself has always maintained, he's not exactly a religious writer, but he uses religion as a kind of mythology. I think religion is used... Uh, in quite a subversive manner in this book because religion is one of those grand narratives one of those giant ideologies as i was mentioning which is thwarted it is evoked like anything else but it's also thwarted this idea of faith or religious faith but having said that the the problem of god is not just a problem of theology it's also a problem in philosophy uh, again, I, I might speak a little bit more into this, uh, but I want to finish uh, the, the part that I wanted to finish today, so I'll go a little bit faster now. But anyway, uh, the problem of God is something that we will come back to. Let's just make a slightly enigmatic remark at this point and say that God is almost essential to the very act of talking, in the sense that God is the addressee. Uh, even if you are addressing yourself, for a believer, let's say, there is, a, there is an entity that is listening to you, listening to what you're saying, and that's God. There's a sort of logical function the, the God phenomenon has when it comes to the idea of speaking. But I'll come back to this a little bit later, uh, maybe tomorrow. Okay, so uh, the first story that, and again, there are these sort of comic remarks, uh, can he move uh, you know, his body at all? Uh, if he could, he would perhaps dance, uh, but then he can't because he's not able to move uh, a bone, in fact. Uh, around page 51 and 52, we have the beginnings of the story after this whole idea of, you know, being duped by the other Basil and Mahu. They're all, you know, masters who are out there to dupe the unnameable. Now, let me just get this story straight to you. It's again one of these failed narrations or failed stories and it's a story that comes from Mahud. Mahud is telling this story to the unnameable as if it is the unnameable's own story. We don't know whether that is correct. That's the politics at work, the politics of, you know, let's say brain feeding. Now, this story involves a very peculiar kind of a homecoming. Uh, not the positive kind of homecoming that I feel in this digital class because I was once a student of Jadavpur University and this department, but a very, very complicated and a very sardonic kind of a homecoming. 
So uh, we are told that the unnameable traveled the world and uh, finally reached his own family. His family, as it were, is again brought into being for the unnameable. Now he reaches the family, doesn't quite reach the house, doesn't quite go into the house. He becomes this weird object of display at a safe distance from the house. I don't know whether this is social distancing back in 1950s. Anyway, so he travels all the world, goes through all these places that I mentioned, Indian Ocean, various things, you know, uh, Sahara and all of that. And he finally reaches uh, his family, doesn't quite go into the house, remains there at a safe distance. And there's this bizarre kind of a narration here that the entire family is almost treating the unnameable as an object of exhibit. There's his wife, there's his children, they are being told about the unnameable. They, they use a searchlight to observe him. Uh, when he moves, they are talking about it. It becomes like a bedtime story for the children. Look, your father just moved, you know, an inch from this place to that. So it's a very bizarre, comical, and at the same time, it will turn sardonic very soon. A weird kind of a story where he's located in the vicinity of his house and his entire family is looking at him but there's no communication whatsoever. And what happens then is even more bizarre and completely farcical. So the entire family dies of sausage poisoning. You know, as I say, death is an important function, but sometimes in a comical way. So this, you know, damn corn beef that kills the entire family uh, after the family dies of sausage poisoning and strangely enough there seems to be an explosion their bodies explode after this sausage poisoning business and uh, you know their entrails are all over the place the unnameable finally enters the house and but anyway that's the end of that story uh, so again you see a story that is just about to begin, but doesn't quite take off. It's just a very, you know, a rudimentary kind of a narrative. The very, you know, let's say, uh, beginnings of a narrative or the very basics of a narrative, but it, it never quite takes off. It doesn't go anywhere. And it kind of, you know, remains as stagnant as the unnameable himself. So this is where uh, this particular, you know, story comes to an end. And again, one of the reasons, if you ask me why these stories are unfinished, why these stories are the way they are, it's because these stories do not come from the subject. They're never owned up by the subject. They always come from the other. It's the other who talks and it's the master who tries to feed these stories. So another thing that emerges from the unnameable, we'll talk about this uh, in the final class anyway, but, uh, you know, is this idea of a kind of a narrative education, how stories are used to educate someone. Stories are, I mean, this is, of course, nothing new. We all know that stories have always been used in various kinds of educational models, not just in literature. Of course, in literature, it becomes obvious. But the idea of storytelling, for example, in the, in the discipline of narrative medicine has picked up quite a bit. Uh, doctors are made to you know, hear and read stories. Uh, Rita Sharon is the, 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 the medical doctor who kind of went and did a PhD in literary studies to sort of in initiate or inaugurate this idea of narrative medicine. Those of you who might be interested in medical humanities, uh, you could sort of look it up. Anyway, uh, I'll not go further in that direction, but let me just quickly see if there's anything else I wanted to say about these stories. Uh, about this story. So as I say, the story begins somewhere around page 52, 53, and it just goes on for two or three pages, nothing more than that, you know. Uh, as I was saying this, this particular part, uh, in the evening after supper, while my wife kept her eye on me, Gaffer and Gamma related my life story to the sleepy children. Bedtime story atmosphere, that's one of Mahon's favorite tricks to produce ostensibly independent testimony in support of my historical existence. But what we see in this story, if you think about it at the level of content, is of course, again, a little bit of a shadow of war. There's a massacre or a kind of explosion that happens that kills off the unnameable's families, family. 
uh, the fact that he is planted into a family, he is given this kind of an artificial family which he doesn't quite own up, is again, if you think about it, part of that whole idea of a human education. A human education is supposed to tell us the value system. It's supposed to instill a kind of value system, a social value system, uh, you know, certainly not a misanthropic value system. So it has to bring in units like the family, the, the social unit of the family, the political unit of the state, and this whole idea of the family being a guardian, the state being another kind of guardian. These are basic sociological trainings that are given in the form of this narrative education, education model. Right. So, uh, you know, as I said, uh, that is what comes under scrutiny, under very strong scrutiny, in fact, in that neighborhood. Uh, is there anything else that I wanted to briefly mention? Just give me one more minute and then we could have one or two questions if there's any. Uh, the, the whole question of free will is also discussed whether there is any freedom, that's where occasionalism comes in. I might talk a little bit more about that, uh, whether the human subject is a free agent or not. Of course, this is a very old theological discussion anyway. Um, we will soon go into the second story, but as I said, I mean, uh, we get this impression from the book that the other is constructing the self, uh, quite literally. Like, for example, if we read this at the end of page 56, I was lacking not only a leg, but an arm also. With regard to the homologous crutch, I seem to have retained sufficient hold, sufficient armpit to hold and maneuver it with the help of my unique foot to kick the end of it uh, forward as occasion required. But what shocked me profoundly to such a degree that my mind, Mahu Dixit, was assailed by insuperable doubts was the suggestion that the misfortune experienced by my family and brought to my notice first by the noise of their agony, then by the smell of their corpses, had caused me to turn back. So he had moved away from uh, the house, went in, saw that entire massacre, uh, moved back, you know. And, and, you know, again, that whole idea of not being able to feel anything, not being able to share the sadness of the family's death. Is it his family at all? I mean, that's, that's of course, the question. Uh, my family, to begin with, it had no part or share in what I was doing. Having set forth from that place, it was only natural I should return to it. So that's, again, the, uh, that's page 57. That's more or less where the, the story, again, sort of veers out and, and ends around page 58. Uh, you know, that's when he is going into the house and, you know, he finds this, all this wreckage of bodies. Uh, this story of homecoming will be contrasted with a more explicit war narrative of homecoming in the final pages of the book that we will come to uh, you know, in the final class. Let's stop here around page 60. We'll pick it up from here tomorrow. And again, I'll try and finish around 30 pages each day so that we're able to finish in time. Okay, let me see if there's, a, there's, a, there's something in the chat box. Okay, so, okay. I'm sorry, I just saw that uh, the voice was... Okay, Anunna, go ahead if you have a question. Sir, I was wondering if the unnameable has any... Or uh, most of Beckett's work, actually. Uh, I mean, I read Waiting for Godot. And, uh, so Beckett has a strange way of uh, subverting the narrative in the book of Genesis. I kind of felt like this in the unnameable. unnameable hmm. Because even in Waiting for Godot, he uh, positioned the play in a place which resembled a fallen garden of Eden. So there was this tree which was bare and the place was not very lush and green as the garden of Eden was. And uh, we see in this unnameable, there is this very uh, strange thing that is happening. So the unnameable uh, wants uh, resist knowledge. He does, uh, it does not want to be named. It, it resists knowledge. It, it, uh, and while in the book of Genesis, God names Adam and Eve, uh, and Adam and Eve, uh, they, they want knowledge. So they swallow the fruit just because they want knowledge. Hmm. So I think this is, uh, I found this interesting that uh, the unnameable kind of uh, is an anti book of Genesis. I don't know if it makes hmm. sense. But, yeah. hmm. No, it does. In fact, that's a very interesting remark. So the whole question of knowledge and uh, withdrawal of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back. Let me make a very quick remark. There was, a, there was an insightful comment. So 
this this point about nominalism and realism nominalism being the the opposite so to speak or uh, the contrary to realism this this is something that again in that same letter i mentioned last time to ahil kaun he he juxtaposes nominalism with realism and nominalism of course is this idea that you know names are just linguistic entities and they do not necessarily have a general object so it's not just about names nominalism believes uh, it does not believe in that idea of realistic correspondence it believes that there are things but they don't necessarily relate to objects uh, sorry there are concepts that do not necessarily relate to objects so yeah i mean this subversion of religious religion and religious faith and this idea of knowledge uh, retraction of knowledge all that sounds very interesting uh, naming is of course a function that is associated with knowledge right i mean that's that's true thank you kiran mai yeah go ahead so uh, i felt that this text uh, is like you know it's almost like a mathematical mobius band okay. would you would you like to comment on that interesting point so the questions continue to be lacanian uh, okay uh, yeah i mean at one level yes because uh, as we would see later on uh, the unnameable would say that i am neither the mind nor the world i have two surfaces and no thickness that's the famous remark uh i have two surfaces and no thickness because i'm like a partition i'm the partition that differentiates two zones so that way i have two surfaces i partake of both surfaces but i don't have a thickness as it were uh this this mobius uh, uh point is is of course quite interesting for others who may not always be aware of this mobius band is a particular kind of topological surface where there is no hard distinction between the inside and outside of the surface so if you walk uh inside a mobius band you might find yourself on the outside of it because it's a twisted surface or a warped surface uh one way of thinking about this mobius thing in the unnameable is to constantly see how the inside is outside uh the internal space of the psyche and the external space of the world become the same like these others these others and this is of course a very preliminary psychoanalytic point the others are inside us they're not just outside us you know uh, there are others outside us of course but the others are also printed inside our psyche and of course a very simple way of understanding that is let's say you know sometimes you know we would say that in the middle of a conversation no i wouldn't do that you know what would my father think or what would my mother think that's a classic example of the other being inside you because you know you're not necessarily you know that your father is not in front of you your mother is not in front of you they're not going to say anything because they don't know but you would still find yourself saying that oh i wouldn't do that you know what would my family members think so uh, let me stop there because it might uh, require a longer explanation but i hope that is some sort of a response to your question yes sir thank you i think we are out of time so let's call it a day here so that you know I don't do what I was just talking about, which is not being able to finish talking. So let me stop here, and we'll uh, congregate again. I think we can use the same link. I've gotten used to this, you know, idea of uh, admitting people and the sound.